Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Moshe, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Congratulations, everybody. Happy birthday. That's a pretty big deal. Um, And uh, let's see. uh, What are some of my preliminary jokes I wanted to make? Um, I like these guys a lot. I think that's the creepiest place to sit. I can't even even imagine deciding to sit there. I feel judged by you already. And... Unless you guys break out in hymns and, qu- and choir stuff, I don't... I don't all right. Uh, I, like the, uh, I like the invisible podium. I like the minimalism of this, although it's uh, upsetting because I, I, I usually like to drop my trousers during a talk because, you know, they tell you to uh, picture the audience naked, but I find that very uh, d- disconcerting in a room of Alcoholics Anonymous to picture you guys naked. Uh, I, that's a, a very horrible image. Uh, so what I like to do is actually make myself naked, and it really calms everything down. But unfortunately for me, I'm just going to have to do it the old-fashioned way. Um, and uh, I think that's all for my uh, little jokey poos. Um, but I, I've been sober, um, let's see, well, let's see. Uh, I've been sober since December 25th, 1994, um, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I got sober very young. It's funny for me to be speaking here because uh, I was uh, young here. You know, I was uh, one of the people, like, that was bothering you at this meeting. Uh, <laughs> smoking and kicking stuff and, like, you know, trying to gra- probably trying to graffiti in the bathroom and stuff like that. And uh, I was a strange kid when I got here. I had, I had a, a, my name, my AA nickname back then was Fila. Um, and that's because I wore so much Fila sportswear. Um, and that's because that stuff was dope back then. And um, uh, if you don't know what dope means, that means a he- hip or cool. Um, and I was that. And I had a southern accent when I got sober. I'm not from the south. I'm, uh, I'm from Oakland. And, uh, but I had a southern accent. And I, had, I used to put in my hair, I used to uh, put three flowers in my hair. Uh, and it, some of you guys might know three flowers, um, and uh, I, it was—it's basically uh, Vaseline. Uh, it's basically Vaseline, um, and I had a comb. I was one of those guys, you know, with like a comb in my pocket. Also, I was all the time like, "What's up, dog? How you doing?" You know, combing. And what happened was I had like a—I it, would sweat, and it, I had this ring of acne because I was a teenager. I had this ring of acne around my face and forehead, and this greasy comb in my pocket, and this southern accent. And I used to wear bicycle gloves because they were my burners in case I had to get into a fight at the meeting, and. Uh, my southern accent and my sagging pants and I'd be in the back and I'd be talking. I'd be like, what's up, girl? You want to make out? And she'd be like, absolutely not. And I'd be like, I didn't want to talk to you anyway. And, uh, and, and, and people would, and you would be telling me to be quiet and be quiet and be quiet. And it's a meeting and we're trying to listen. And I just did not care about your needs to listen to a meeting. I just couldn't care less. I just, it was not interesting to me that you wanted to listen because I was young and I was feeling myself. Um, but anyway, um, now I'm, so I'm sober, uh, tw- since December 25th of 1994, which means that New Year's Eve of 1995, uh, I was like six days sober. And, um, and that's, um, I, I got invited to a party that night. Um, and I, uh, and it was like a, it was a party. It was like, you know, it's a party. And I was, I was 15 when I got sober. Um, and, uh, you know, you remember when you were 15, some of you might, might not remember when you're 15. Um, that's okay. Um, but uh, when you're 15, you get invited to a party, super big deal. Also a big deal for me because at the time I had stopped getting invited to parties because me and my friends were the kind of people that would come to your party, rifle through your mom's jewelry, you know, kick the keg over, uh, call you a bitch and leave. Um, <laughs> so we never got invited back, right, Micah? <laughs> he was there. Um, and... Uh, Anyway, I got invited to this party. Now, I knew that if I um, went to the party that I was going to get drunk. I just knew it. I knew it. No no question about it. I'm six days sober. I'm at a party. I'm going to get drunk if I go to the party. 
Um, but I really wanted to go, man. If you, can, if you can imagine how much I wanted to go, you know. And then I, the other, only other thing I knew about that was going on was um, there was an AA dance that night in Danville. Um, the, the sort of center of the nightlife scene in the Bay Area. <laughs> and it, it, wasn't a, not a, it wasn't even a young people's dance. And, and those, are, those suck enough, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was a regular people. And by regular, I mean old. <laughs> and I agonized, you know? I agonized about what to do. And in the end, I decided to go to the AA dance. And I stayed sober that night. And my, I got a ride to Danville. And I went and, uh, is Rose here? No. This girl, Rose, was, uh, not that Rose, another Rose, uh, it was the only other young person in the room. And we went and we sat outside, we smoked cigarettes, and we talked about how much life sucked. And then at 12.01, my mommy came and picked me up, and I went home. <laughs> and that was my first sober New Year's. Um, and it was awful. Uh, it was boring and terrible and glum and, 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 uh, and, you know, I mean, there's no other side to the story. There's not like, uh, I don't have the part where like, you know, I get like, oh, and then, you know, biker Joe came outside and he put his arms around me, he told me a poem he wrote in the pen and it changed everything for me. Uh, no, it was just bad. And I was like, wow, this is awful. But. You know, hindsight being 2020, I now get to look back at that time and realize that it was decisions like that, little jumping off points that changed the trajectory of my entire life. And that it was little decisions like that, making the decision to take, put recovery first, even when it was uncomfortable, even when it was frightening, even when what I wanted more than anything else was to go hang out with people, get drunk, have a good time. I made the decision to put recovery first. It's those kinds of decisions that have changed my life. Um, and so if you're new in the room tonight and you are, I want to say like, if you're new in the room tonight, you're doing something very special for yourself, uh, which is that you're, you are investing in your own life. And for people like us, for, I'll just say for people like me, investing in my own life was not something that I was particularly, uh, um, skilled at. All of my behaviors brought me to a deeper and lower level of degradation and humiliation. And I didn't get here when I was 15 based on, like, my mommy found my marijuana stash. And then I went to an after-school program, and I decided AA was the place for me. Um, I hated it here. And, um, and I didn't want to be here. And people love to tell you how lucky you are to be getting sober. When you get sober young, people tell you all the time, you're so lucky. How lucky you are. It's lucky. What luck for you. Lucky you. <laughs> like, oh, really? This is lucky, huh? Awesome. <laughs> this, uh, this doesn't feel like lucky. This feels like death. Um, you know, what are we doing tonight? It's Friday night. Recovery bowling. Awesome. Great. I, I was hoping. Um, so I didn't find myself to be, to be particularly lucky um, when I got here. Um, I didn't find, I, I mean, I know it was, in, maybe it was inspirational to everybody else, but to me it was just a bummer. Um, I was the youngest person in the whole fellowship in Oakland. I was that one. And this was a cool meeting for me because it's like, uh, it really is like a blast from the past, man. It's like, um, well, like Tracy came up and Ben came up and they both, I don't know if you remember, there were the, the young people, the young pretty people that took long-term sobriety. It's like both of those people were very, like Tracy uh, was, was the person that had gotten sober young like me. And it was like a real miracle. And I would just be like, look, she can do it. I can do it. And uh, Ben, you know, I met Ben like six days in and he, was, he had like forever sober. And I was just like, it's just a really cool thing. And my, you know, my friends, my friends are here. And it, it, it's a really neat thing for me to look back on this life that I've spent in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. I mean, I was, I'll just real quickly tell you about, um, like, this uh, life that I had in AA was, um, was got it got, did get exciting you know uh, the danville dance there used to be a dance some of the people here were used to do that dance and that dance man would just that was the reason that i kept coming back man i didn't even know that there was a large meeting going on uh that the dance was somehow a subsidiary of i was just there to dance in my fila gear i had my fila hat 
I had this one outfit that I would wear to every dance. It was my Fila hat and a Fila t-shirt, Fila shorts, Fila socks, and Fila shoes. And I was good to go. Uh, and I would go to the Danville dance on the first Saturday, and I would go to the Concord Fellowship on the second Saturday, and then there was a Pleasant Hill N.A. dance on the third Saturday, and on the fourth Saturday I prayed to whatever God I believed in to make it through the weekend. Um, we all did. We just said, there's no hope without a dance. Um, and, uh, you know, we played cards, we played spades, and we dined and ditched at Denny's, and we... Um, and we, uh, we, we would sneak into AA conventions, like w one of us would show up, one of us would register, go into the dance, find another person who registered, take their badge, walk out, pin it to one of us, we'd walk in and continue cycle until all of young people's AA snuck into the dance. Uh, that's what we did. Oh, no, and maybe some of you are shaking your head disapprovingly. But, you know, that's just what I did, man. That's the way that life was. I was uh, that, that was life. And I, and, and, I mean, I guess I could go make amends to s someone. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was doing whatever I could, man. You know, I want to say um, uh, I love AA. And uh, just so you know that, I don't have the most, con I mean, this is going to sound so snide, like pompous, but I don't have the most, maybe I don't have the most conventional story in the world. Uh, I got sober super young. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not a, um, I, I'm not sure I'm, I, I'm not a fundamentalist. I was a fundamentalist. I used to be a fundamentalist. I found it uncomfortable. I've decided to have a nice life instead. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, but I love AA, you know, um, and I used to love AA the way you love a new girlfriend. You know what I mean? Like, oh my God, did you hear what she said tonight? Oh my God, she said she likes me. And isn't that amazing? I'm like, no, everybody says that. That's the way it sounds when you talk to people. Like, oh, she's so pretty. Isn't she pretty and perfect and amazing? And everything she says is like liquid butter. It's amazing. Uh, I used to love AA like that. Like I used to be blown away by e by everything, and everything was perfect. And I just and and the, so that was amazing, and that's what carried me through through AA for a long time. And these days, I love AA the way that I love my family, um, and uh, I love it. And it's all that it, it, I didn't choose it. Uh, I didn't. I, it, I didn't. I didn't necessarily even want it, but it's. I love it. And it's a big part of who I am. And it's built up my entire life. And it's, it, it's, it informs my identity. And it informs the decisions I make today. I can't imagine life without it. I care more about it than I care about almost anything else. And sometimes it bugs the hell out of me. And sometimes I find it difficult to deal with. Sometimes it's hard to uh, adhere to or to listen to. Sometimes it's just difficult. But I just can't. I don't have much of a choice in the matter. i got to keep coming back. I got to keep showing up because this is the, who I am. Uh, I'm an alcoholic, and these are the principles I've chosen to live my life by. Now, uh, how did I get in here? That's a good question. Um, well, I, I, uh, I, I, I moved to California from uh, my my mom's actually here tonight. She, my mom's, uh, God bless her. She is a big fan of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, uh, I was a kid, I was an angry, insane, obsessive, feral child. I was a, I was a monster. I was a nightmare of a child. I was a, I was a constantly kicking and screaming and foaming and angry. And I mean, I, was, I went to therapy for the first time when I was four years old. Four years old therapy. That was what I was. And I, and, and, and I was in, I was, I, I was so uncomfortable and I was so out of control and so unpleasant and all of the teachers had me send, I, I mean, I'm going to get into where, where I, I, I ended up with uh, school. I was lost in school, just lost. I was just a, mo a little monster child lit. So when I found uh, alcohol, uh, that was, okay, first of all, let's just say, like, you already know what I'm going to say. Uh, sometimes I wonder why we even go to AA meetings, because everybody says the exact same thing, you know what I mean? Like, the story is exactly the same. Like, oh, I felt so different, and then I found alcohol, and it made me forget about my differences and made me just feel okay for the first time. So I kept drinking, because it was the thing that made me feel okay. But then, just like a boomerang, it turned around and cut my life to ribbons. And, and then 
I found I couldn't stop, so I sought help in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I found that help, and then I went to college. Um, <laughs> that's like the same, that's like AA story right there. Uh, that's, but I felt different. Um, I did, man, and I was different. You know, I'm from Oakland, and I'm, um, I'm a little Jew, and I'm... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, my parents are deaf, and we're, 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 I'm a welfare kid, and a latchkey kid, and a and a, a white kid, and a oh, isn't that hard? That's tough. Um, anyway, <laughs> whatever. I felt different. It doesn't matter why I felt different. What, what's a, it doesn't matter at all why I felt different. The point is, and and it's not even. It's not like we're the only people that feel different too. You know, sometimes people in AA, I mean, they love to blame normal human things on alcoholism. You know what I mean? Like. I don't know what it is. I'm such an alcoholic. This guy cut me off in traffic, and I threw a Snapple bottle at his windshield. <laughs> what an alcoholic. No, what a dick. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know that my weird disposition made me an alcoholic. I know that the first time... I know that this, this is part of what makes me an alcoholic, is the first time I drank, all of that weird, un abnormal disposition went away. I didn't feel uncomfortable at all. I didn't feel, uh, I didn't feel broke. I didn't feel weird. I didn't feel white. I was an ambiguous race that was intimidating to everybody. I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I just, I, I forgot about who I was. I forgot about myself, and I was just able to be. You know what I mean? I was just able to be. And so I continued to drink because that was the only thing that made me feel that way. And I continued to drink in that manner just regardless of what it was doing to me on the outside. Other people looked at me and said it was out of control almost immediately. Now, getting sober young um, for me has a slight, seems to have a slightly different uh, arc uh, of behavior. You know, like if you start drinking later, it seems to me from the stories I've heard that you slowly chip away at the edifice of your life and your morality and your ideas and your, uh, you, you compromise who you are. When I was 12 years old, there was nothing to compromise. Uh, I jumped in. I was. A, I started drinking daily and getting high daily from the very, very, very beginning. And by the time I was uh, 14, I had, I got thrown into a mental hospital. I got locked up in a mental institution. I spent my another New Year's. I spent in uh, Ross Hospital, um, and I uh, and, uh, I, and I got out of there. I went to my first rehab when I was 13. Uh, I landed. At, I was at Newbridge. Anybody Newbridge up in this piece up in here? They used to have an adolescent program. Uh, that's where I met my friend Gerald. Uh, my first, actually, my best friend Gerald's here, and my first day at Newbridge was a field trip to another rehab uh, <laughs> to go watch him graduate. This stranger. Like, and then we would come back and we would solder uh, uh, stained glass, and then this ex-cons would yell at us. I'm like, that's cool. Um, but... Um, so I went to rehab for the first time when I was 13, and, and, and uh, there was a lot of consequences that came very quickly. Um, I got, I got, um, I, I started doing very strange things very quickly. Uh, I started, I was, I was, a, let me just say, a teenage alcoholic is the worst thing to have in your household. I mean, it's just the worst thing because there's no, that's like I say, like there's no, like I'm gonna do better for you, honey, or whatever. You know, you might do that. Your wife, honey, you know, I love you. It was just like, no, I'm not gonna do better for you. I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> I want you to suffer. That's why I do this. And, and I was like, you know, I would do weird things. Like I was graffitiing on the wall in my own house. And my mom would be like, I know you did it. You know, like, <laughs> um, or I would, uh, I was, uh, I would, I was fond of peeing. I was a big pisser. I peed a lot. Peeing on the, I would pee on the, pee on the floor in my house, like just on the ground, or um, I'm not sure my mom knows that. Do you know that? Are you aware of that? <laughs> oh, she, yeah, she knows. Okay. Uh, I would pee like in these weird bottles, you know, you know the pee collection that we get, you know, or like, uh, you know, peeing in the heater because it made a funny sound, you know, a f uh, funny smell. I found out later too. I do want to say there's a lot of urine in my story. Um, I know this is Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I don't want to offend anybody, uh, but uh, this is just my story. 
Out of respect for the traditions, though, I'll now refer to urine as uh, yellow alcohol. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's, <laughs> that's a bad joke. Um, anyway, all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get real. All right. <laughs> I mean, all these things were happening, you know what I mean? All these different things were happening. And, um, and I, I was in a lot of trouble, man. I was just in a lot of trouble. I, uh, I, was, I, I was getting arrested all the time, and I was punching holes in the... I mean, it wasn't all funny, you know? I mean, it's funny now looking back, but it's like I really abused my family. I really hurt my, my, my mother and my brother and my grandma and my home. I was punching windshields in of cars and kicking doors down and throwing things and breaking windows and throwing my shoes at windows when I'd get mad. Whenever I get mad, I'd start throwing stuff, um, and, I, and I, was, I was violent, and I was out of control, and I I was a thief. I loved to steal money to get, I just stole money. I loved that. I w- that was what I did because I was, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old and I needed to get what I needed to get. And I was in my mother's purse and I was selling my stepfather's CDs and my stepfather's books and my own clothes and stuff I would find around the house or stealing credit cards and ATM cards and, uh, you know, uh, stealing money from my grandma's purse and wrestling with my grandma for th- this money. And like, and uh, oh, that's real funny, guys. Um, and, uh, you know, all this crazy stuff, man. Um, and I was just so out of control. But, you know, the, the through line through all of this out of control drinking uh, was really that, that the problem was that people wouldn't get off my back. Um, and that people wouldn't just, if people would just leave me alone, I could be free to do what I need to do, which is, I guess, steal from you. Um, people are so uptight about that. And, um, and like one day I realized um, that I, I looked back, I, I had the police telling me that I was a problem. I had the Oakland police come to my house and have a meeting with my parents. You know, this officer Joe Carranza, uh, I can say his last name because he's an asshole. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, anyway, no, he came to my house and he had a meeting with my parents and he sat down and told him just what a, what a just... He was a real piece of work, this guy. He would just search us on site. That was like, I was like that kid in, in, in that neighborhood kid, little band of wild, ne'er-do-well, crazy kids. And he hated us so much. And he would search us on site. Every time he'd see us, he would search us. And he would all, we'd always have some things. We'd always be getting in trouble and getting arrested by this guy. And like, I remember I was like 30 days sober. And you remember when you're like 30 days sober and like things start to like look better and you're just like, everything's great. You know, you don't even realize that it's only been a month because to you, it's been like absolute eternity. It seems like it's been forever. So you feel like everybody out there has like probably got the message or whatever. So I was like walking along and he, there was, this, I remember I was walking uh, through, on, uh, through Oakland. There was this guy, like uh, this bum asleep on the, on the ground, like full on prone. Like I, I'm now having a dream that I'm in a nice bed, kind of just like full on. And uh, I walked by him and I, the cop was there, like dude, the, uh, Joe was there. And I was like, How's it going, officer? Like, total, like, little brat. You know what I mean? And then he was like, you see this guy? This is you. And I was like, thanks a lot, officer. Be seeing you. Um, so that's Officer Joe. And um, so I had all of these uh, problems, you know what I mean? Uh, all these crazy behavioral problems. And I, got, I dropped out of school in the seventh grade, uh, in the eighth grade. Uh, I'm a junior high school dropout. And then I went back to school. Um, well, I... The way that I dropped out of school was a funny story. I, um, I, I got beat up by a seventh grader. I was in eighth grade, and this dude said something smart to me, so I slapped him as hard as I could in the face. And I figured that'd be the end of that. <laughs> no. Um, here's how the fight went. Uh, I would swing, and he would dodge the punch, and then he would punch me in the face. And then I would swing again, and he would again dodge the punch, and punch me in the face. And this went on and on and on. Um, cause apparently this guy knew how to fight and, uh, and, uh, he, we got, everything got broken up and then we both got suspended. And, um, and, uh, I went back, I was suspended and the, the week was over. I had two black eyes. So I was like a little raccoon boy. And, uh, and my, like, uh, uh, I had to go back to school though. I had two black eyes. So like a true pimp, I asked my mom to put some makeup on me so that nobody would see uh these black eyes so you know you know she sat me down gangster style and she uh made me into a painted lady and uh i went back to school and all of these kids were like making fun of me and stuff they're like yeah you got you got you know beat up haha i was like yeah you're right fair enough i did and they're like yeah you got you know you got whooped by a seventh grade i was like yeah true that and then this one kid corn nuts uh said to me he's like wow you got your ass beat is that makeup 
That was it. I never went back. That was it. That was, that was it. I dropped out of school right there. And then I went back. I, they forced me, you know, uh, so I was out of school. I never successfully passed a grade, passed the seventh grade. And uh, uh, I went back. I got forced back into school by, uh, by you know, the courts. I got forced to, uh, after that to go to this place called Seneca Center for the Severely Emotionally Disturbed Youngster, which is just as nice as it sounds. Um, <laughs> And it was really nice. I mean, it was like, uh, it was, I had to take the short yellow bus to school. Um, uh, I, there was a padded cell in the classroom. Um, and nothing will distract you from a lecture about Christopher Columbus quite like a feral, insane child slamming his body against a padded door, screaming, let me out of my cage. Um, and uh, if you talked at a turn at Seneca Center, you had to stand and put your nose up against the wall for five minutes. Like, and I'd probably, I don't know, hum like a Marine song or something like that and flagellate or something. Um, all of these things make my life particularly unmanageable, right? Um, none of them make my life uh, alcoholic yet because, you know, there were other kids in Seneca Center for the severely emotionally disturbed youngster. And I don't know any of them from AA. I haven't met any of them in AA. What makes me an alcoholic is, well, there are a couple things. One is the day that I realized that this idea of everybody's, that the problem was everybody else getting off my back stopped making sense, you know, that the police were wrong and Oakland Public Schools was wrong and my mother was wrong and my counselor was wrong and my rehab counselor was wrong and my individual therapist and my family therapist and my group therapist, <laughs> that they were all wrong and they were all pointing the finger at me and they all needed to get off my back. One day, I had this moment of clarity that that didn't make a lot of sense and that maybe that the problem was what they were pointing at. And, uh, and it really blew my mind, you know what I mean? It really kind of like changed everything and I really felt like I had a solution, you know? My solution was to just get it together. Anybody have that solution before? Like, I'm just going to get it together and I'm going to get... I'm gonna get my life together and and then everything will be cool i had this idea that like everything was going to be okay all by itself that no you know no but no effort on my part was going to have to happen i was just going to somehow someone's going to call me and be like hey this is college um we heard about you and we heard you're pretty smart we don't mind that you drink daily and steal money from your parents to buy drugs uh, or that you're a seventh grade uh, dropout, we'd like you to come to college. Uh, that call never came. And I started to realize that I was never going to escape this life, that this life was never going to change. And Because every day was like the, the last day. Every day I would try to get out of bed, and I would uh, go back to bed. And then I would get up eventually, and I would steal money, and I would go and I would either steal some booze from Safeway, or I would go buy some drugs, and I would... Uh, and I would, then I would think, I got to stop this. Um, I really have to stop. I can't keep doing this. I can't keep hurting everybody around me. I can't keep hurting the people that love me. I really need some help. It, it ends here. And then I would go to bed. And then I would wake up. And then I would go back to bed. And then I would go steal some money. And then I would go steal some booze. And then I'd think, well, did something, did I miss something? No, okay, I got to stop this. I have to stop this. And then I go to bed. And then I wake up, and I steal some money. And then, does this starting to bore you? Yeah, it started to bore me too. But I couldn't find a way out of it. I couldn't escape it. It was like I couldn't stop. I had this idea that I would just get my life together, and I couldn't do it. It's like my my brother talks about the idea that uh, that it's a singularly alcoholic problem. That at the very moment you realize that alcohol is your problem, is the very same moment that you can no longer do anything about it. And that's the place that I found myself. The moment I realized alcohol and, and the life I'm living is my problem, I then also realized I had no power to change it. I, I realized that because I went to my drug dealer's house. And um, I, I went to him and I paid him for yesterday's bag. And I said, um, uh, look, I'm out, I'm out the game, man. I'm done. I'm, I won't be coming back here. And he was like, okay. So the next day when I went to his house to buy a bag, um, <laughs> he looked at me and he said, uh, he said, what are you doing here, man? He's like, you said yesterday you quit. Here you are again today. He's like, you really have a problem. Uh, so if your drug dealer ever does an intervention on you, it's time to get help. <laughs> Seek help. Um, and that started my uh, journey of quitting. 
you know, I just was quitting all the time. I was always quitting. Um, and uh, it's a lonely place to be, man. Uh, you know, I'm and now sober ha- almost half my life. And I got sober very young, um, obviously. And I would be a particularly uh, shallow and unintrospective person if I didn't ask myself why I'm still here. Uh, why, after all these years, Alcoholics Anonymous still applies to me. Um, and so I th- think a lot about that, you know. Um, I think a lot about what, what I'm still doing here. And I'm going to try to answer that uh, question in a, in, in a way that makes sense uh, tonight, the reasons that I'm still here. But one of them is that I really, really remember how painful and frightened I was, uh, frightening it was when I realized I had no power over making my own problem go away. I finally found the reason why I had so many problems in the first place, and I tried with all of my might to effect some change on that problem, and I found myself doing the exact same thing. Not that I found myself not getting much better, or that I found myself uh, um, unable to fully master my problem, I found myself unable to even remember the problem the next day. Not even to remember that I had said yesterday that I was never going to drink again. I would wake up in the morning and I would think about drinking. And I wouldn't have two, an angel and a devil pop up on my shoulder. You know what I mean? I wouldn't have one guy like, remember the path that you've chosen. Come with us to the community Presbyterian church. And then on the other shoulder was the devil, like, ah, forget it. Let's get some St. Ides. Let's go right on a wall. Let's piss on the floor. <laughs> and then I then had a problem figuring out who the right one was, and I would go towards the devil. That it seems like it's how it should have been, but that's not how it was at all. How it really was was that I woke up in the morning, the obsession to drink would hit, and I wouldn't even remember that I had quit the day before. The w- only thing I could think about was the bottle that I was going to get, was the money I was going to steal, was the, was the life that I was the, the forgetting. Um, I get very hazy memory when I stare at a bottle. You know what I mean? I can be thinking about all of the problems that I have, and once that bottle of St. Ides is in front of me, the, the, the St. Ides, I mean, a classy, a, a man's drink. Um, is St. Ides even a, is that real anymore? Does, does that exist anymore? Do they still have it? Really? No? Wow, I outlasted St. Ides? All right, moment of silence. Um, man, I loved St. Ides. I didn't drink... Listen, my drinks were... If you gangster rapped about it, I drank it. That was how I determined... If gangsters rapped about it, that was gin and juice, Cisco, um, St. Ides, crazy malt liquor. Um, and that was, that was it. I didn't, I've never had... The only wine I ever had was Carlo Rossi, and that's because E-40 sung about it. I, don't, I didn't... I didn't know anything about Pinot or whatever. I don't even whatever it is that people drink this stuff. So, okay. All right. So, so that happened. I found myself living the same day again and again. And um, I'd been to rehab, and I'd been to rehab a number of different times. And, uh, and so I came to AA asking for help. And I guess I think that's a, that's a pretty significant thing to do is to come into AA and to ask for help. And, okay, here's part of the, th- the problem with AA. Um, I hate adults. I mean, I hate them. Every adult I've ever met has you know, wanted to put me in jail or wanted to give me a pill uh, or wanted to uh, you know, lock me up or wanted to tell me to stop drinking or wanted to you know, tell me that it's not okay to hit your grandma. All, like, I hated adults, you know what I mean? And I came into AA, and guess what? All adults. When a total, everyone is an adult in AA. Uh, when you're 15, like everybody's an adult, period. So I hated everybody. And then I started listening. And something happened that was really miraculous. When I heard these people talking, um, I stopped thinking of them as adults. And I started thinking of them as alcoholics. And what they said uh, started to resonate inside of me. And that's real dangerous. Like, if you're in AA and you're starting to really relate, yeah, bad news. Um, <laughs> like if you're doing this, you are you should be doing this because you're not ever getting out of here. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I came into AA. You know, I came into AA, and I gotta say that this is something that this is another reason that I still am here after all of these years, because my life was on a just an absolute. I mean, just 
oh, 100% crash and burn all the way down. And there's a line of demarcation in my life the day before I came to AA, the day after I came to AA, where my st- life started going like this. I mean, it, was, it, was sign- it wasn't significant at first, but almost immediately I started to realize that things were changing. I started, I mean, the minute I came into AA, the day that I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous and asked for help, everything flipped over from a slow, steady decline to a slow, steady uh, uphill. And I should rephrase, it wasn't a slow, steady decline. It was a quick crash and burn, and it was slow and steady on the way back up. And that's a problem for me, uh, because my sponsor and I talk a lot about the idea that I want to drink the program. Um, and you can't drink the program. That's the bad news. So there's some bad news. Anybody that tells you there's no bad news here is not being completely honest with you. The bad news is that AA doesn't work like alcohol does. I like alcohol because I get to open a bottle, drink it, and I feel different immediately. Um, It doesn't matter that I feel different immediately and I know that slowly it corrodes my life, that it makes me unable to function in society, that it ruins everything on the outside, that it dissolves all of the relationships I have. None of that matters because if I can drink it now, I can feel okay and forget about all that stuff. Alcoholics Anonymous works the exact opposite way. There's no way for me to crack it open and for me to drink it and for me to be okay right now. I can't do that. It's slow. It takes time. It doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't change the way I feel. It just changes the way I am. Uh, the good news is that, it, that what it does is the opposite of what alcohol d- did for me as well. It makes my life bigger. It makes my reality bigger. It makes me feel more deeply. It makes my world m- more large. It makes my relationships more deep and profound and amazing. It makes my life bigger. Alcohol painted me into a corner. The only thing I could do was drink. And the only thing I've been able to do since I got here, since the day I got here, was, was uh, I started living. Um, and I, I guess, you know, if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know what it's like to have a life that doesn't feel like life, you know. Um, there was a speaker, she said, um, I just heard at this meeting a few days ago in L.A., she said, this is, ba- this is some more bad news, we're all going to die. This is true. Um, We're all going to die, every one of us. The question is, what are we going to be doing until then? Are we going to spend our time living, or are we going to spend our time trying to blot out the fact that we're that we're even alive? So, so okay. So that's a little bit uh, uh, gothic. Um, (laughs) I'll pep it up. (laughs) Why am I still here? You know, a lot of people say that they're still in AA because they're afraid of relapse, right? They're afraid of going back to that life. And I'd be lying if I said I wasn't afraid of that. I don't ever want to live like that again. I don't ever want to feel out of control of myself. I don't want to hurt the people that I love. I don't want to be controlled by a beverage. By the way, have you thought about that? It's a beverage. It's an inanimate object. It exists in 7-Eleven right now. It's waiting for you there right now. It's just sitting there in a bottle, not doing anything. It's just a thing, a liquid, a thing. And if you weren't into liquids, well, it's something else. But it's just a thing. And it controlled my life, man. This beverage? This is water. Like, this is a much more important beverage. I don't even ever, ever think about water. I thought about booze all day long. What happens when they put juice and it ferments is that it controls my life? What, did the little demons in there come out and start manipulating the puppet strings of my mind? It's insane when you think about it. I don't want to go back to that. I never want to go back to that. I I don't want to be in that life. But that's not why I'm still here. Um, It can't be. For me, this is just for me. For you, everything might be different. Um, Beware the person that tells you how it is for you or how it is for us, or how we do here in group think. Um, beware that person, or the person that has the special way, he's figured out the special way, um, get away from me. Like, if you know a special way, the, the special way of AA, like the secret way, that the real truth, get away from me. I do not want to drink from your poison well. I do not want to move to Guyana. I'm not interested. Um, it's just for me. I mean, if you're that guy and I'm offending you right now, get away from me. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's another thing. It's like, because okay, I didn't want special AA. If they tried to give me 15-year-old AA, by the way, 
If they had come to me with a 15-year-old coloring book, like, this is a coloring book about your feelings. Your resentments are represented by circles and shapes. Um, your fears are these Legos. And um, just be a little kid, and we love you, scamper. If they would treated me like that, they would have killed me. Because I didn't have a 15-year-old alcoholism. I had regular alcoholism. Just like there's no black alcoholism and there's no uh, disabled alcoholism. And there's no gay alcoholism and there's no straight alcoholism. There's just alcoholism and it affects us or it doesn't affect us. You either have it or you don't. And if you've got it, it's time to get better, right? Um, so, so, I'm a, so I have some fear about drinking again. But that's not why I stay here. Because fear is the reason that I drank. Fear is the reason that I lived the way that I did. Fear is a destructive, uh, it's not, a, this is just for me. Again, I don't know anything about anybody else uh, or what you're supposed to be doing or what's true for you. I don't know. I don't have any opinion about what you do. I only have experience about what I've done. And for me, fear is not a nourishing enough substance to keep me sober over the long term. It kept me sober for a long time. But now I'm looking at my life and I'm saying, am I... Is it possible? Because fear destroys. That's for me. Like it says in the book, that fear has an, it's an evil and corroding thread. Corroding means that it starts to eat away. And fear will not nourish me. I won't be able to stay sober long term through fear. The reason that I stay sober is not from fear of the bottle. It's from gratitude for the life that I found in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's that I enjoy this life. It's that I want to be here. It's that gratitude is, it feeds me. And it makes my life bigger. And fear makes my life smaller and smaller and smaller. And I drank because I was afraid. I drank because I was afraid. And I don't even exactly know why I was so afraid, but I was afraid. It was like I had this little ball of fear behind me from the very beginning, this little ball that followed me around everywhere I would go. And, I would, uh, and it freaked me out. And I would, the first time I drank, I found that I could actually outrun it a little bit. It was like this go-fast juice, you know what I mean? And I could drink, and I could outrun the ball, and I could do what I needed to do. And uh, as the ball kept following me, but I was able to outrun it, so it didn't matter. Even though I would look behind every once in a while, I noticed it was starting to accumulate things, like a little snowball picking things up as it went behind me. You know, uh-oh, you're peeing on the floor, and uh, you know, you're getting kicked out of seventh grade, and Oakland Public Schools doesn't want you, and it's picking stuff up, and it's getting bigger and bigger. And I'm having to drink more and more of the go-fast juice to outrun this big ball. I keep running, and it keeps following me and getting bigger and bigger and bigger until I, I mean it, at, at a certain point it was towering above me it had court cases in it it had my mom in it it had officer joe carranza in it it had oakland police department it had everybody in the world in it actually at a certain point all adults everybody is just falling behind me and i'm looking and i can feel it behind me and it's gaining on me that's the other problem it's gaining on me it's getting faster or maybe i'm getting slower i keep drinking and i keep trying to outrun this thing but it seems like i can't drink enough of this go fast juice to outrun this ball and it's getting closer and closer and closer until I think to myself, I'm not going to make it. This is never going to change. This thing's going to destroy me. And I ran into Alcoholics Anonymous with this big ball behind me. And I screamed, you got to help me. I got this big ball. And they were like, yes, okay, we know what to do. We've had this before. I was like, all right, awesome. What do I do? They're like, stop running. And I was like, uh, I don't think you understand the nature of the problem. This ball is going to destroy me. I, I need another solution. They say, don't worry. Trust us. Just stop running. And I was like, okay, I'll stop running. Bam. It ran me over, destroyed me, ground me into the earth. It just, and I picked myself up and I said, what the hell were you talking about? Stop running. That hurt so bad. And they're like, yeah, it does hurt. <laughs> it hurts. That hurts a lot. A lot. <laughs> And I, uh, I picked myself up and I dusted myself off and I realized that I wasn't destroyed and that I wasn't dead. And I looked at this big ball and it had stopped following me. And it was just sitting over there. And I said, well, now what do I do? And they handed me a tool kit and they opened it up. And they gave me a tool, whatever a man would say at this point. They gave me a, a ball-peen hammer and a chisel. <laughs> and they told me to get to work. And that's what I've been doing, you know. I walked over to this big, you ever see the, um, the, uh, the phantom toll booth? There's this part in there where it's like a, what the, the guys do, these, these meaningless actions where he's got a little nail and he's got a hammer and he's supposed, to, uh, he's supposed to hammer at the mountain until the mountain moves. And that's what I did, though. 
it felt like a mountain and over time it's gotten smaller and smaller until I realized it was never even really that big in the first place. And I've just been hammering away at that little ball and figuring out who I really am, you know. And uh, so here's who I am. I'm me. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, a guy. I'm just a man. I'm not a special man. I'm not special because I'm in AA. We're, you like this? This is a good one. Uh, people in AA are smarter and more creative than other people. Yeah, where do you hear that most often? Oh, that's right, in AA meetings, right. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're, we're way smarter than other people. We're smarter and, and more creative. And you can tell because I've, if you'll notice, I've knitted this uh, serenity prayer at sunset. I mean, is this smart and creative? Uh, okay, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know that I'm smarter and more creative than other... I mean, I'm smarter and more creative than other people. <laughs> but that's not because I'm an alcoholic. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, but I do know that we're alcoholics. That can be... That's pretty simple. Right? Alcoholics, we can... I don't know if we're smarter or more creative or more sensitive. Or, but we are more alcoholic. Um <laughs> And so, like, you know, it's like people talk a lot about, I mean, you know, it's inconvenient to be an alcoholic. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people get up and they say, oh, I'm so grateful to be an alcoholic. And, of course, if you're not grateful to be an alcoholic, that's like the worst thing you could possibly hear. Um, it doesn't matter if you're grateful. It doesn't matter if you're happy. It doesn't matter if you like AA. It doesn't matter if you're here for good reasons or if you believe that the first 164 pages are the truth or if you wear a tie or if you shave. None of that stuff matters. It doesn't matter if you like AA. It doesn't matter if you're a, an active member that, that loves it and, and that talks a lot about it. It doesn't matter that you, you, you uh, wax eloquent about how the truth is in the book. It doesn't matter if you show up. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters to me, again, I'm doing a lot of you, but I don't know anything about you. The only thing that matters for me is what I'm doing. It's not what I'm feeling. It's not if I like it or if I'm... Gr like, here's the thing. I know a lot of people. When I first got sober, there was a guy named Larry, um, who some of you might remember, uh, who was the center of AA in my fellowship. He was the man. He loved AA. He loved the book. He quoted the book. He knew the book inside and out. He was grateful for AA. He loved it more than me, a lot more. But he was also stealing money from the treasury, and he was also uh, he was also being dishonest. And that guy's been drunk for years. There's also people that have come into AA like me who hated everything about it, didn't want to be here, resented the fact that they had to come, but who got a sponsor, worked the steps, and started taking the principles into their lives. And those people are sober. So to me, when I look at it, I think to myself, there's got to be a through line between. Uh, okay, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. Um, I also hear a lot of people uh, in AA say, I don't know what keeps people sober. Now, I don't know anything, uh, but I do know what I've seen, what I've experienced. What I have experienced is that there's a lot of people in AA who drink, and there's a lot of people in AA who stay sober. All of the people who drink seem to do similar things. All of the people who stay sober seem to do similar things. The people who drink seem to not be too involved with helping other people, not be too involved with working the 12 steps. And I'm not saying that no one's ever drank who's worked through the 12 steps. I think that's nonsense. I, there are 6 billion people in the world. Somebody's done something. Um, but I, I have noticed that that's the pattern of people that drink. And I've also noticed that the pattern of people that stay sober, there's no other through line, by the way. I have not noticed that people that are conservative stay sober longer or people that are gay stay sober longer, people that wear certain outfits stay sober longer, people who have particularly sharp razors that are able to shave stay sober. I've not noticed that. I mean, I've not noticed. That's not something that I've noticed. People who are active in service, who are active in the 12 steps, active in helping other people, active in a spiritual life, those are the people that I've noticed stay sober. So my question really becomes, do I want to stay sober? If I want to stay sober, then, I, then for me, the answer is really obvious. It's a plan of attack. It's a plan of action, and it's in the 12 steps. That's, a, that's about as dogmatic as I'll get tonight. But um, I guess that's pretty good news, you know, because I never could see a way out before, man. I felt so closed in by my own life, I felt like I would never make it out. And uh, I made it out. Um, okay, so let me – the final reason that I stay sober – um, is that it's not just that um, I'm afraid and it's not just that I like it here, but it's also like, you know, I had, um, I had uh, an enemy. I've ha I had an enemy in AA. I've had a couple enemies in AA. And, um, and I've, I've had a couple of experiences where um, 
you know, people have hurt me really, really egre egregiously. And I've been really hurt, and they really did things that were wrong, and they were really terrible, and I was totally in the right to be angry. And yet, five, six years later, I was still s the one that was suffering from that anger. That years later, I was still unable to feel free. And at night, when I would think about things, I would still think about amends that I owed. And so I had to go back over my own life, and I had to, you know, the whole thing where it's the inventory is ours and not the other man's. That's a really difficult passage in the book. It means that uh, the point of it all is is that these enemies that I've had, I've had to find my own part and go and make amends. Here's one of the. Here's a secret. For me, when I go and make amends to someone I hate, when I go apologize to someone I hate, my ang it's not only that do I make the amends, my resentment goes away too. I don't hate them anymore. Everything changes in that moment. And that's the life that I want. I want a life that doesn't give me any quarter when it comes to having uh, justified resentments. I want a life where I have, to, I have to constantly be looking at myself and figuring out you know, who I am and, and, and why I'm here and how these principles apply to me. And even when someone hurts me, I still have to take these principles into my life. That's the life that I want. And I don't even know if that's a, a, a life that sounds attractive if you're brand new. But I will say that because of the life that I have now, uh, I no longer hurt the people in my life constantly. I no longer steal from the people in my life. I no longer uh, physically assault the people in my life. Uh, almost never. Um, I feel free. You know, I feel free. It's like, okay, so this is what's happened in my life in the last two years. Um, we recently in Oakland, we, uh, we lost a member uh, of, of our fellowship who uh, just couldn't take it anymore and who ended her own life. Um, um, before that, a girl that I served with on a service committee for a long time uh, relapsed and, uh, and, and uh, shot some bad dope, and she's dead. Two kids, and they don't have a mother anymore. Um, a kid that I grew up with who was in and out, uh, had come in and out of AA and decided that he didn't want to stick around. Uh, that this place was filled with squares, went to the doctor, and they told him if he kept drinking, he was going to die, and he kept drinking, and he died. Um, my best friend in the world, who I did all of my using with, I went to rehab with for the first time, uh, and uh, 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 he, he just decided that AA wasn't for him anymore. Um, uh, other people that I've been sober with since I was 15, you know, for, for, for more than a decade have decided to check out. And all of these things are, uh, are happening in my life. And I'm really having to ask myself, and, you know, it's not a dangerous question. Why are you in Alcoholics Anonymous? What is the reason that you're here? It's not a dangerous question. I feel like it's a dangerous question not to ask myself. If I'm here mindlessly, I will drink mindlessly. If I'm not active in my recovery, I am active in making a decision to take another drink. The reason that I'm still here is the same reason that I was here in the first place, is that I want a better life. I don't want to suffer. I don't want people around me to hurt because I can't control my own behavior. I want to live. I want a big life. And that's what I've gotten in AA. I went back to school. I went to community college, and I sat up in the front, and I asked for help, and I did my homework, you know, stuff I learned in AA, you know. And uh, it was time for me to transfer to a, to a university, and I, 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 like I said, I was a seventh grade dropout, and I had a lot of problems with learning and stuff, and I had never gotten past, uh, you know, like sort of beginning arithmetic, and I couldn't get through the math part, but I applied to university anyway. One school, alcoholic plant, and they rejected me, alcoholic result. Um, <laughs> And I applied to UC Santa Barbara, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and they rejected me. And I wrote them back, and I said, if you know anything about UC Santa Barbara, I said, listen, your school is filled with alcoholics. Um, I am a sober alcoholic. You need to just accept me and have me be there just so that I can be there and be sober. And they said, okay. Um, so... so I went back to school. I, I, I went and I graduated from college and I you know, graduated. I did well and whatever. I got out of there. Um, and I tra I've done all kinds of cool stuff. I've traveled around the world. I've spent, uh, you remember that first New Year's I spent, that sad New Year's? 
I've spent New Year's all over the world, you know, because I was on this service commi- committee for AA that it was always on New Year's. So I've gone all over the place. I've had all these exciting times in New Year's, spending time with the people I love. Uh, it was in the beaches in Mexico and in Canada, and in, uh, we just did it one in Reno, all these AA conventions celebrating this life that we found here together. I've had all these exciting one, these exciting New Year's and stuff. Nothing ever compares to that first New Year's I spent smoking cigarettes with Rose and talking about what life was going to be like. Because we had no idea, man. We just had no idea. She um, is still around or went out and came back and, 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 and is still here. And we both had no idea. Um, this is what I want to say uh, in closing, I think. Um, okay, my life is very big. Uh, my life is really incredible. I moved to L.A. because I uh, uh, do stand-up comedy, and I, and I went down there to go do that. And uh, that's going very well. I've had work published. I've been around the world. I've, I've, all kinds of very, very exciting things have happened in my life. Um, but also some very sad things have happened in my life. I lost my father, I lost my grandma, I lost my dog. This is all like within a, a year, you know what I mean? I w- uh, it's like, the dog? Really? You're going to take the dog really? You know, after all this? Couldn't I just have my dog, please? Um, uh, I've had my heart broken. I've uh, broken hearts. I've uh, made mistakes. I've flubbed. I've sold drugs in AA. I've, uh, I've, uh, I, I should have told that story without just dropping it on the room. But uh, <laughs> kind of... <laughs> kind of out of time but uh i um you know i've had i've had i've had all kinds of scary and terrible things happen to me i've had crises of faith i've thought i've thought i didn't believe in god i thought i believed in god i've been i've known everything about alcoholics anonymous i've known nothing about alcoholics anonymous i've told you how you should live your life i've figured out i didn't even know how to live my own i've judged you for your behavior i've then participated in that very behavior by the way watch out for that um That'll happen. Anything you judge somebody else for, odds are very good you're going to be doing it soon. Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, Anyway, um, I've done everything wrong. I've done everything right. I've just had a life in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've just lived here. And I just want to keep living here. I I don't want to figure out how to find perfection. I don't want to figure out what you're doing wrong or the right way to be. I don't want that. Judgment is not an AA principle. Um, but we spend a lot of time doing that. I can't tell you how many meetings I've sat in thinking of what a crappy speaker I was listening to. So if you're thinking that about me, mm-mm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I judge people's behavior. I judge people's recovery, constantly judging people's recovery. I judge people's message. I judge, I judge, I judge. But that's not Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is love and service. What I should have been doing while I was busy judging was just loving people. And you know, the most difficult thing for me to do is to love people who drink and to not judge them for that decision either, to say I love you anyway and that Alcoholics Anonymous will be here for you if you decide to come back, no matter what you do, because that's the message that they gave me when I got here. They told me no matter what you did, we're going to love you anyway. And no matter what you've done tonight, if you're in the room tonight, no matter what you've done, I just love you anyway. I don't care. Even if I hate you, I love you. Um, and that is true. Um, there are certain people who I just can't stand, but I love them anyway, you know? Um, so if you're new tonight and you're wondering wh- what any of this has to do with you, the good news is you don't need to figure any of that out, you know? You just need to go to another meeting. You just need to go to another meeting. Uh, you know, like AA started in 1935. Uh, one guy wasn't sure he was going to be able to stay sober. So he called, he started calling random people in the phone book and saying, can I speak with an alcoholic, please? This is before AA. Can you imagine what that phone call sounded like? Like, can I speak with an alcoholic? Click. He found somebody. Somebody said, I know somebody. Found, they found somebody's wife. The wife forced the person to talk to him. Didn't even want to speak to the guy. Hey, there's an alcoholic who wants to talk to you. No, thank you. <laughs> well, he wants to talk to you. She said, so one of those guys said, fine, I'll talk to him. I'll give him 15 minutes. They talked for four hours. It was, that was Bill W. and Dr. Bob, right? They talked for four hours. A little while later, Dr. Bob took his last drink, and Alcoholics Anonymous started. Two people. One guy was in a hotel lobby, met one other guy. Two people had a little conversation. Something changed. They went to a meeting. Now everything's different, okay? <laughs> These two people talked to two other people. Those two people talked to two other people. Fast forward. 60 years later, I'm in Oakland. I'm 15. I'm a Jew. My mom's deaf. I can't stop drinking. What am I going to do? Oakland Police Department. Joe 
need some help. Somehow these two old guys in 1935 did something that set up a meeting on 29th and Telegraph in Oakland for me so that I could show up, so that I could show up, so that I could show up and I could hear something from those old adults talking that was, didn't sound like nonsense and it didn't sound like judgment. It just sounded like love. It's the same thing that's happening right now if you're new. Somehow that, those two guys set this whole thing up for you. If you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, just go to another meeting tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.